happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lorden Arts Channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery, and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery? Today's episode is called Friends for Life. Chad Swedberg lived on the White Earth Reservation in Ogumma, Minnesota, all of his life. In 2007, he was 34 years old and lived in a house with his wife, Leslie Fain, and some of her relatives. Family was very important to Chad. He held his friendships close as well, keeping many of the same friends from his school days well into his adult life. He had a construction business, hunted beavers, caught leeches that area fishermen used as bait, and would take on miscellaneous handyman jobs that he could find. On April 13th, he was working on one of his other endeavors, a maple syruping operation. About a half mile from his home, Chad collected tree sap from the maple trees near a clearing, heated it in a large pan using firewood, and then filtered it into clean, sweet maple syrup. At about 8 a.m., Chad headed out to make some more maple syrup. Not long after he left, his wife Leslie heard two gunshots. Deer season hadn't started so there should have been no hunters in the area. Between 8.13 a.m. and 9.46 a.m., she called her husband five times. Chad never answered. Once she was ready for work, she walked down the trail to check on him. As she neared the maple syrup operation, she found Chad lying on the ground. When she could find no pulse, she realized he was dead. She didn't see any blood and assumed that he may have had a heart attack, she then called a neighbor and asked them to wait at the house for paramedics, fearing that no one would be able to find the operation. At 9.57 a.m., she called 911. Within a matter of minutes, two police officers arrived and were taken to Leslie and Chad. They saw Chad lying next to the cooker he used to process syrup. They checked for vital signs, but it was too late. They turned Chad over to see if there were any wounds, and blood began to soak through his shirt. EMTs arrived and peeled back multiple layers of clothes that he wore, and they located a bullet wound. That was when Leslie told the officers about the gunshot she heard before finding her husband. An autopsy showed that he had been shot in the right shoulder and the left buttock. There was no gunpowder around the bullet holes, and further analysis showed that he had been shot with a rifle from a distance. The bullets were almost too damaged for identification, but a firearms examiner was reasonably certain that they were from a 30 caliber rifle and were probably Winchester silver tips. As investigators started to assess the area around the maple syrup operation, they realized that there were several trails leading away from the site. When they investigated the Northern trail, it led to a T. Near the T, two tracks of footprints were found. They ran for about 20 feet, going north and south from the murder scene. The other end of the trail wrapped around to the southeastern corner of Fish Hook Lake. The only people who lived nearby were Kenneth Anderson and his brother Frank. When Kenneth was questioned, he immediately proclaimed his innocence and insisted that Chad had been his best friend since childhood and he would never harm him. He said that the day of the murder, he called Chad to see if he would go to the bank with him to finalize loan papers for a leaching operation that Kenneth wanted to start. Chad, however, declined. Kenneth also claimed that he had gone to the tax preparer that same morning. The employee he dealt with at Jackson Hewitt said that Kenneth had an appointment in the afternoon, but instead showed up at 9.45 a.m. insisting that she move up his appointment. She also stated that he seemed very nervous. When investigators looked into Chad and Kenneth's relationship, they found that in 2006, they started and ran KC Construction, where they built pole barns. To save on the cost of lumber, they would recycle telephone poles and use them as framing for the foundation of the barn. According to Chad's family and friends, he was having a hard time working with Kenneth. Trouble started between the two when a Yamaha Grizzly ATV, along with aluminum ramps, were stolen from a home where Casey Construction was building a barn. It's reported that Kenneth would later confess to a friend that he had actually stolen the vehicle. However, on a recent television show, he claimed that Chad admitted to stealing it. Three months later, investigators discovered the stolen ATV behind Chad's house. When he was questioned about it, 
he was surprised that the grizzly was there. When the registration was checked, it reportedly went back to Kenneth's mother. Chad agreed to get Kenneth on the phone for investigators so that they could question him and so that the conversation could be recorded. Needing more information to make an arrest, a search warrant was executed on Kenneth's house and property on the 12th of December. Although they found nothing there, they did discover that he owned several guns. They were all taken in and verified as belonging to him. Among them was a Tika bolt-action rifle that Chad had bought for him just months before. When investigators went to Frank Anderson's house right next door, they found the stolen ATV ramps sitting outside next to his garage. On January 4th, 2007, Kenneth was charged with felony theft. His hearing date was set for April 16th, and Chad was scheduled to testify for the prosecution, though friends and family didn't believe Chad would actually testify against his best friend. This would never come about, as Chad was killed three days before the trial. On June 7th, investigators traveled to Kenneth's house yet again to execute another search warrant. Again, he proclaimed his innocence. When he was asked about that bolt-action rifle, he claimed to no longer own it. He said he had traded the rifle for two muzzle loaders. One stayed with him and the other went to Chad. He also said that he took a high-powered scope off the rifle before it was traded to use on another gun. When Kenneth saw that some of the officers were searching the utility buildings on his property, he became agitated. There, in a barn, well hidden under insulation high up on a rafter, was the rifle that he claimed to no longer own. He was arrested and charged for the murder of Chad Swetberg. At his trial in June of 2008, he continued to proclaim his innocence. Even though some felt the motive for this murder was weak, it didn't take a jury long to find him guilty of first-degree premeditated murder. He was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. His mother, Geraldine Bellinger, told the press, Justice was not served here. My son did not get a fair trial. I know deep in my heart my son did not kill Chad Swedberg, and I will not stop until the truth comes out. To this day, she still campaigns to have her son released. An appeal for his case was presented to the Minnesota Supreme Court in 2010. His attorneys claimed that the search warrant of his property in June of 2007 was executed improperly. They also claimed that his jailhouse privacy rights were violated when his calls to his attorney were recorded. However, the Supreme Court upheld his murder conviction. From his jail cell, Kenneth claims that the police framed him for this murder because he is Native American. The Becker County Sheriff's Office said the allegations are ludicrous and impossible. Case cracked. I would like to thank Inforum.com, CaseLaw.FineLaw.com, Newspapers.com, WhiteEarth.com, DIYPoleBarns.com, and MonstersAndCritics.com. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case, and here she is to discuss it with us now. Hey, Christy. Uh, wow. This, this case, it's one of those that I feel a little uncertain about. Okay. And uh, the family, you know, obviously thinks that there's reasonable doubt in this case. They actually have a website put up. You guys can go check it out for yourself. The website is KenAndersonIsInnocent.com. Now, before I kind of talk about what I thought about the website, did you find any compelling information there? Well, I did find a couple of things to talk about. Um, you know, I know we mentioned in the script that there was prejudice in this area. And according to the family, it's really bad. When you look at it, Chad was white, Anderson was Native American, and there were no Native Americans on the jury either. Uh, I just, how could they let that happen in a case like that? I mean, taking place on a reservation. And I, yeah. I looked into the reservation. I believe it's the biggest reservation in Minnesota on top of really? that. Yeah, and it just seems like with a case like that, um, yeah, yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't let something like that happen. Um, no, you shouldn't. Admittedly, you know, Minnesota, uh, it's, it's pretty white. Like if there's, <laughs> you know, just the, the population, I'm sure if you look at the numbers, but still with a case of that nature, um, they, they really should have not let it go that way. Uh, anything else that you saw in there? 
There was. There was one other point that he made. <clears throat> Excuse me. I thought it was a fair point, but I'm, uh, I don't know how I feel about this. Anderson said, why would I have hid that gun in the rafters of my barn when there's a lake nearby? Um, you know, I think there's something to be said for keeping control of it, mm -hmm. you know, where you know where it is. I, I think there's just, uh, and keeping it on private property. I mean, mm -hmm. how many cases have we looked into where private property has been a stopping block for finding evidence or finding missing persons? Um, so honestly, it's not that great of an argument because you go throw it in a lake, yeah. all of a sudden it's in public property. It could be searched regularly by volunteers or by law enforcement. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that's super well thought out. Uh, well, and if you think about it too, I know and I believe we're going to show one of these in the show. There's a picture from when they found the gun and took it out of the barn. Yeah. And it doesn't have the scope on it, just like you said. Right, right, right. Yeah, and that's, I, I've got a point here about that too. Um, I did find some interesting perspectives in the comment section. Quite honestly, I felt like the website wasn't, it wasn't put together great. Like, mm -hmm. you know, right off the, if, if you're trying to get someone to see your side on, on a case like this, uh, I would have right at that homepage, the big five points, like first thing, just right in your face. This can't be true because of this. This isn't right because of that. This expert said that this information is incorrect. Like just boom, 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 boom. And when I went there, that's not what I saw at all. What I saw was basically like a long form blog format of his his court trial fight stuff just going yeah. back and forth oh we're finally getting another hearing and you know for someone that has a life sentence that's not super rare you know that's that's kind of what happens because they're just fighting to to change the situation that they're in mm -hmm. so you always have some news like that so i was kind of like i was just looking for information that was kind of more about the questions that were raised there's a very good solution to this which we'll touch on by the end of all this but the comment section kind of gave me what I was looking for there. There was a comment left there by someone named Tanya. Quote, the rifle in question has never been definitively proven to be the murder weapon, nor the bullets proven to be from that gun because they were so damaged. If that was the only element that sent Ken to prison and those issues were not proven, that's easily injustice. I think it's a good point because mm -hmm. obviously the forensics are falling apart a little bit. You don't have the rifling marks because the bullets are so damaged. So you can't test them against the gun and say, yes, they were actually fired from this particular gun. Mm -hmm. So I see that forensically this thing gets a little shaky. Yeah. Um, but cases, there's no rule that cases have to have solid forensics and you have this real damaging thing in Kenneth lying. Mm -hmm. He lied about owning the gun and yeah. then they found it on his property. So unless you believe that someone took the gun and put it back on his property to set him up, which honestly, in this kind of story, I'm, I'm actually still open to as well, because from uh, the story about the ATV, we have to believe that someone planted that on Chad's property. Mm -hmm. Chad didn't know it was there. How did the ATV get in his backyard? You know? Mm -hmm. So you have to believe that planting could happen in one direction with this case. Is it really yeah. possible that someone could have planted the rifle? Now, uh, Kenneth basically says that he gave the rifle. Uh, well, it's interesting. He told the police that he traded it for those two muzzle loaders and that, you know, he got one and Chad got the other. Uh, there is a television show called Reasonable Doubt. Great name, especially for a case like this. Uh, I think his story changes there. I think he says that he actually gave the gun back to Chad, which is interesting because mm -hmm. Chad originally gave him the gun. So, um, and it's kind of interesting to once again, note this story is changing and everything is kind of being pushed back to the guy that doesn't get to talk anymore. That doesn't get to mm -hmm. defend himself. Um, so, uh, Christy in the script, it kind of sounded like there was two sets of tracks at the trail when mm -hmm. we get to that T uh, was there a possibility that Frank was there? Cause that was the first thing I was thinking was like, Oh, was this the brothers? Like, did they go there together? Well, according to that episode on this case for reasonable doubt, they said that Frank was at work that day and they interviewed Frank. So yeah. 
I, yeah. I believe him. Yeah. 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 I didn't get anything weird off of Frank at all uh, from, from that episode. He seems very believable and concerned. And quite honestly, it, it's weird because all the friends, like none of them really think that Kenneth could have done this. Like yeah. there, there, there was just this big pushback when it came to the friends thinking he could do this. But there's some really interesting moments in that episode um, where I don't know, it's it's got me scratching my head. Mm -hmm. uh, a very interesting moment happens when they're interviewing Ken. He says that Chad told him that Chad stole the ATV. So now we've got another fact that is being pinned back to Chad, who once again can't defend himself. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just one of those things that I don't know if these stories are changing because he's found this kind of convenient excuse where if he pins all of this back to Chad, it really can't be proven out or not. Um, I did find some comments theorizing that Chad's wife could have been involved in some way. Mm -hmm. You know, if the gun did get back to their house, could she have planted it back over at Kenneth? Something like that. But I really didn't find anything very compelling in terms of information to really support that. It was just, you know, theories being talked about in a chat, basically. Well, and they they are, even from him. I mean, the things that he said, they are possible. Yeah. But I don't find them probable. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, there, you can be open to the possibilities. I get that. But then be looking for the information to either support or you know, take those possibilities mm -hmm. out of play. Yeah. And uh, seems like there might be another potential victim in this too. Yeah. Yes, there is. Because Kenneth's mother has continued to fund his legal battle and she's racked up over $140,000 in legal debt fees trying to free him. Oh, man. She, she's an old woman. She should be in the light, you know, the, the great years of her life here. And she's going to work until the day she's gone, unfortunately. Yeah. She's in her early seventies, uh, you know, taking out loans on their home. Yeah. And then on top of that, uh, carrying all this debt, you know, I, I just, I would think that if I was in Kenneth's shoes at some point, I would just say, mom, stop. Yeah. You know? Like we, there's no way we're going to win that. Even if it's right, there's no way we're going to win this. Mm -hmm. Just don't, you know, don't do this to yourself. Um, Cause at some point who knows, maybe there is a medical issue she has to deal with or something happens to another member of the family. And now she is tapped out. Like she's, she's yeah. saddled with a huge amount of debt. So, yeah, I, I felt really bad for her. Yeah. Um, I just want to say uh, reasonable doubts. The first time that I've watched an episode of that show, I was highly impressed. They've got a really smart format worked out for it. They go and they talk to the families first. They kind of get what I was looking for at the website and couldn't find. They boil yeah. it down to like, what are the top four or five points that you think prove that, you know, this is a, a false incarceration. Mm -hmm. And then they go and test those out. But then they have this conversation at the end where they actually go back and speak to the family. Yes. And tell them what they found. And they're, they're very blunt about what they find. Um, I was very, very impressed by it. I think you guys should check it out. If you want to see the episode tied to this case, it's in season four, it's episode two, and it's called My Best Friend's Murder. Christy, thank you so much for all your hard work on today's case. We really appreciate you. And I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporters, Sigrid E. O'Hearn, Jennifer Dixon, and Angela Welch Sola. For over six years, we have always run limited commercial ads here on YouTube and we can't do that without support. If you'd like to help the channel keep going and growing, please visit lordandarts.com. There, you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Cynthia Teeter recently did. We know that learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is important to help us understand the many unsolved cases we also cover. And we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit seriouslymysterious.com and subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon below if you'd like to catch one of our weekly secret studio live shows. And of course, I'll be back with a new unsolved mystery for you on Friday, right here on the Lord and Arts channel.